Okay, let's open our Bibles once again to the book of Ezra. And tonight, Ezra chapter 5. Ezra chapter 5. And let's begin with verses 1 and 2. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God, helping them. Note Haggai's fellow prophet, Zechariah, prophesied the future of Jerusalem and the state of Israel, uh, as well as the future of the 193 members of the United Nations. Go forward to the book of Isaiah, chapter 2. Isaiah, chapter 2. And notice here in Isaiah 2, verse 4, he wrote, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The second half of that verse was used on a statue um, at the UN in New York City. It was given to them by a Russian sculptor in 1959. The, by the last name of, and I can't pronounce Russian names very well, Yukatich, Yukatich. And uh, the title of the statue was, Let Us Beat Our Swords Into Plowshares. And it depicts a, a man with a hammer, hammering on a sword uh, for the purpose of shaping it into a farm implement, a plowshare. We go to Zephaniah, chapter 3, and verse 8. Zephaniah 3, and verse 8, small little book near the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah 3, verse 8, we read, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. The problem with the UN is they left off the most important clause of that verse, and he shall judge among the nations. You cannot have peace without the Prince of Peace bringing it and enforcing it, and bringing it about. This is the, the eternal sin of unsaved men, unregenerated men. Now go forward about a sixteenth of an inch to Zechariah. Zechariah and let's start there. Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12, and verses 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, where they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, although all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Look at Zechariah 12, verses uh, 7 through 9. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Now, of course, Christ will be there uh, coming back literally to sit upon a throne. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's a chilling warning when you think about it. All the nations, there are 193 nations in the UN, well, not counting Israel, 192, who are doing all they can to oppose the rights and the freedom of the state of Israel and the safety and security of the Jew uh, to this very day. Uh, especially those uh, nations partial or uh, empathetic to Islam and the Muslims. All the nations surrounding Israel, whether it's Lebanon or Syria or Saudi Arabia or Jordan, all of those nations are going to be destroyed. God is going to wipe out every Muslim when he comes back uh, at the second return of, of Jesus Christ. They are the enemies of Jerusalem and they align themselves against Jerusalem and against the Jew uh, under the, under the uh, banner of the Antichrist. And this is what we've been waiting for, someone who hates the Jew as much as we do. And we can finally push them into the Mediterranean and take over their land. But God is going to wipe them all out. And also look uh, at verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. That's the Lord God speaking, but it's a great uh, verse to support the doctrine of the Trinity. They shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, meaning Christ. Acts 20 um, and verse 28, Paul says, uh, Take heed yourselves unto all the church over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was the blood of God. And that's why the doctrine of the Trinity is so vital to you and I learning the Bible and understanding the Bible. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14, and verses 1, 2, and 3. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. You recall um, how that God led the Israelites through the Red Sea, and they got through to the other side while the waters were separated, and Pharaoh's army of Egypt pursued in after them, and God closed up the waters on Pharaoh and his armies, um, and Moses uh, and the Israelites sang a song of praise to God that God had gone out and he had fought their battles for them and fought their enemies uh, and overthrew their enemies for them. And God will do the same to every Muslim, to every UN uh, um, Confederate country, to every nation that opposes the Jew or opposes the right of the Jew to live in the land that God first gave to Abraham. Every single one of them are going to be wiped out. Now, the UN left out the first clause in Isaiah's prophecy, which is the key element. He shall judge among the nations. Zechariah's words will mean catastrophe for any nation or for any people who are enemies of Jerusalem. Also notice in our text that both Haggai and Zechariah prophesy in the name of the Lord, there in verse 1. Not in the name of Allah, not in the name of the Virgin Mary, not in the name of any Catholic saints, not in the name of any Hindu deity or in the name of any uh, Buddhist deity, not in the name of Islam or any other religious belief. They prophesy in the name of the Lord God Jehovah. He is the God of Israel. In verse 2, the actual construction on the temple begins. The foundation was laid back in chapter 3 
verses 10 and 11, which we won't go back to, before it was brought to a halt under Artaxerxes' decree. Both Haggai and Zechariah are said to be helping in the building there in verse 2, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. The powers that be commanded one thing back in chapter 4, verse 21. Artaxerxes said, Give ye now commandment to cause these men to cease. But the Jews were in subjection to a higher law of God. Go back, if you will, run back to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus 1, and notice one verse there, verse 17. Exodus 1, 17. But the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men of men children alive. You know, they talk about ethics and the rule of right and wrong in certain situations. And I don't know if anyone's ever compiled a list that would be all scriptural uh, examples of the ethics of God, but this would be a good one. If, in this case, Pharaoh meant to destroy all the male children, all the male babies among the Israelites, and he gave word to the two primary Egyptian midwives, when a woman delivers a baby, find some way to strangle that or kill it upon delivery, uh, so the, that their seed dies out in time. But they wouldn't do it. When, and of course they went and they gave answer back to Pharaoh, the, the Hebrew women are lively and they, they you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, they go into labor before we can get there and help out, and it's, it's, we don't have a good chance to then kill the babies. Uh, when someone means harm to an innocent person, it's okay to lie to that first person in order to save the life of that innocent person. That's how you'd have to look at it, especially if someone means harm to the Jew. Remember Cory Ten Boom and uh, the hiding place? How they uh, protected Jews in a, a false walled-in closet in their home in uh, the Netherlands, or Holland, during World War II from the Nazis. And um, give whatever excuse you have to give to save that person alive. And that's how God does it. Look also forward at uh, the book of Acts, and Acts chapter, I want to say Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, and one verse there, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's the direction, the, direct, the directive for a child of God, to obey God and what would be honoring in the eyes of God rather than men. You obey God, a true believer in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ, must obey uh, the revealed will of God and the desire of God instead of obeying Caesar or the government, or any popes, or any U.S. congressmen or the Supreme Court, or the whims of the ACLU, and so forth. Do you know something? I don't know how many of you heard about this. There's a bill being uh, batted around in Sacramento right now, and uh, I don't know if it was signed by uh, Governor Brown uh, the other day, or he's about to sign it, and this will uh, prohibit any sort of Christian counseling that tries to talk a homosexual out of their lifestyle and embrace a normal lifestyle. And, and it will prohibit you from using, <clears throat> and, and it will make illegal the distribution of any books that are used to counsel that person. Well, one of those books is going to be the Bible. And Governor Brown, whose sexuality was questionable back in the 70s, remember? His uh, stint with uh, the singer Linda Ronstadt, everybody thought was a ruse anyway, just to throw people off the scent of the trail. But, 
But if, they, if it's been signed or if it's going to be signed, uh, you and I would still be expected by God to use the scripture to show somebody this is what God's law is. This is how God defines a marriage, a man and a woman. Let me say something. Anybody who says they're a Christian, I don't, doesn't matter what stripe they, they uh, subscribe to, what, what kind of Christian they think they are. Anybody that says two men or two women should be allowed to be married, it's, it's a matter of love, isn't it, so forth. The, the, the model that Jesus Christ, the Word of God gives for the Lord Jesus Christ and his church is the model of a husband and a wife. Christ the bridegroom and the church his bride. You couldn't blaspheme Jesus Christ any worse than by saying two women are the same thing as a man and a woman, or two men. They're queer. There's something deviant up here and something wicked in here. And they're simply violating the plain language of the scriptures. Uh, the Bible says that the time would come when they'd call, some men would call good, evil, and evil, good. And that time is now. So if they pass it or haven't, or, or have passed it, this is all done by, if anyone watching by, by YouTube, let me tell you, this is all done by the Democratic Party in the United States. The Democratic Party in the United States is a purely socialistic organization that does not believe in the, the vision of the framers, the Constitution, the founding of this country. Whenever they want to propose something in court, they never cite the Constitution. They cite some uh, earlier court decision as the basis of their beliefs that we should go farther than that and expand the definition of a marriage or make abortion uh, legal uh, no matter what or whatever the case may be. They can't cite the vision or the, the belief or the faith of the founders because they don't have any. And I'll go so far as to say, if, if you vote for a, a, a Democrat in the United States, I wonder if you're even saved. It's that bad. It is that bad. And half the Republicans I don't trust either. So I'm, I'm an equal opportunity uh, um, critic. Anyway, the true believer is expected to obey God rather than men. Now, three of the biggest evils in the world have always been Islam, Roman Catholicism, and the Greek Orthodox Church. And we might throw in the Anglican Church, which is sort of a spin-off of Catholicism. But uh, these groups have all been engaged in setting up state churches so that their religion can control the government and they can in turn control the actions and the lives of people. In Roman Catholicism, there is no separation of church and state. There's no con That concept doesn't exist. The Pope is the spiritual head of the church, and he's also the political head of the government. Vatican State is the smallest actual country in the world, about 100 acres. And thus, every baptized church member is an automatic citizen of the Vatican, no matter where he re actually resides in. He has dual citizenship there. He just doesn't know it in, in most cases. I had that confirmed to me by a Catholic priest riding in the funeral car with me one time. I ran that by him and I said, doesn't that mean that every baptized Catholic is an automatic citizen of Vatican State? And without hesitating, he said, yes. All baptismal records, all wedding records, all uh, church membership records are recorded in Vatican so we know where our church members are and uh, we can you know, make decisions on where to send relief and aid and food and disaster relief and so forth to help our church members. Um, but anyway, this is why our, our missionaries, uh, like Brother Klein mentioned on Sunday, run into hostility and are bad mouth and slandered in countries that have state churches. They fear any um, opposing view. They fear any different uh, viewpoint or idea being taught to the people. They've got a monopoly and they want to keep it that way. And those countries do so in the name of God or in the name of Christianity. But those churches don't know God nor are they Christians. There are no state churches or the hint of any state church found in the New Testament. 
Groups like Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism are grievous wolves that would love to enter in and not spare the flock, uh, as the New Testament says, Acts 20, verse 29, if they could. Catholicism and uh, Greek or Eastern Orthodoxy, they are wolves in sheep's clothing, as Jesus described in Matthew 7, 15. They're within the church or within Christendom. Now let's continue for verses 3, 4, and 5 in our text. <laughs> At the same time came to them Tatnai, governor on this side the river, and Shethar Boznai, and their companions, and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Then said we unto them after this manner, What are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius, and then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Now the building of the temple is underway, and Haggai and Zechariah show up at the right time to preach and to encourage it. And uh, this was the key to Israel's success. Run back quickly to 2 Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Chronicles 20 and I think it's verse 20. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. That's how the prosperity to the Jew came in the Old Testament, by obeying uh, and believing, uh, and then obeying the prophets. And Haggai and Zechariah were encouraging them to pick up this, let's, let's uh, uh, continue this building project, regardless of what the, the, uh, uh, King of Persia has to say about it. Now, in verse 3, the adversaries turn out to be some government officials on a, uh, some routine inspection. And these governors, as one of them is called there in verse 3, were also called viceroys and satraps. And you might have heard that word before, satrap was a ruler over a certain province in the ancient kingdom of Persia. And uh, under, the, under this time, under the King Darius of the Persian Empire, there were 120 provinces. And Daniel mentions that in Daniel chapter 6. But uh, observe the peculiar shift from the third person plural, verse 3, and said thus unto them, to the first person plural, verse 4, then said we. This would mean that the Jews themselves are asking, what are the names of the men that make this building? Now, they are either asking their fellow Jews, yeah, who's in charge of this project? Or who's in charge here? Which is highly improbable. And that would sound like they're trying to court favor with those sent out by the king of Persia or they are being sarcastic toward the government inspectors. Uh, you want to know their names? You want to know their names? You want some of this, huh? You want that? Which might be, however, they, it's also possible, this is probably more likely, that in verse four, Ezra is quoting part of the letter that gets sent back to King Darius, the report sent back to King Darius, which begins in the next verse, verse 6. Notice how verse 4 matches the language of uh, verses 9 and 10. Then asked me those elders and said unto them thus, Who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. And then Ezra adds verse 5 to the narrative, 
which would be from Israel's point of view. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. And then they returned to answer by letter concerning this matter. That's probably the best way to handle that change in voice from verses 3 to 4. 